Thank you. Hi, everyone. Are you having a good time at Work It? That's what I thought. <laughs> um, I'm Aminatu So. I'm the co-host of the podcast, Call Your Girlfriend. It's a podcast for long-distance besties. We talk about friendship, female friendship specifically, and uh, really anything we want to. Uh, that's, the, that's what's exciting about not having a boss. <laughs> and today on stage with me are some amazing, amazing women who, do, who make great podcasts. I... Um, if you've never seen them before or you're not familiar with them, uh, each of them make podcasts that deal with subjects that are really hard to report on. So starting with um, Rebecca Carroll, who's here and the host of the... I'm not the host. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> um, Rebecca Carroll, the host of There Goes the Neighborhood. I'm not the host. Um, <laughs> I'm not the host, but well, that's okay. I mean, I'm a producer. Uh, producer yeah, on, yeah. of There Goes the Neighborhood, Kathy Chu of Nancy, and Nigel Poor of Ear Hustle. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Their work is really complex, and they do great reporting on it. The whole focus of this panel specifically is about reporting on those complex kind of topics without gawking or tokenizing your subjects. And so we're going to play some tape so we can all hear, um, we can all get a sense of what it is that they do. So um, Rebecca Carroll is at WNYC. Rebecca, can you tell us a little bit about the show and this sure. clip that we're going to hear today? Sure. So the concept for There Goes the Neighborhood uh, predated my joining WNYC. So when I got there um, and was told, you know, we'd love to have you work on this project, it's about gentrification. I really audibly sighed. Like, I really was like, oh, God, how do we make that interesting? Everybody's talking about it. At the time, I lived in Williamsburg, which is essentially, you know, like the mecca of, of gentrification in Brooklyn. Um, and so what it was really uh, the biggest challenge was to figure out how to make it interesting. And so I just went out and started to talk to people um, in various neighborhoods. And the clip that you're going to hear is the, is the interview that turned it for me. It was the first interview that I did um, for the reporting. And as soon as I had this conversation, I knew what it was about. Uh, can I get a latte? Latte? Sure. You're going to sit down here this year and take it to me? Uh, to go. You know what's interesting? The other day I was walking in my neighborhood and I saw a black elderly gentleman that I hadn't seen in a couple months and he literally, his eyes flew open and he said, oh, you're still here. And I went, yeah, and you're still here. Things have changed, haven't they? And we were like, yeah, black folks are disappearing. That is really amazing. Kathy, can you tell us about Nancy and the tape that you brought today? So Nancy is a queer podcast made by some queer people for queer people, and it's born out of a, a friendship that I struck up with my life partner, Tobin Lowe, that I met a few years ago. And um, he likes to call us um, contest winners and noted homosexuals. I don't know if he still feels that way, but we uh, won the uh, WNYC's Podcast Accelerator. So pilot of the show, and now we're, we're with them. And the clip that I brought um, is a conversation between two men from different generations, both living with HIV. And um, it was sort of a, a culmination of a coworker coming to us and saying, like, I don't know what young people with HIV, what they're thinking, what they're living with, and you know, with these new advances in medication. I just don't know how they live and do they remember the stuff that we went through. And we brought the two together to talk and, and see what happens. People were saying, you know, would you have wrapped it up? And I know that's not a safe sex measure, but no, I probably wouldn't use the condom because I was in a trusting relationship. We were getting tested, so I wouldn't change anything. I don't know if I would change anything either because it was wonderful to come to New York and be in love and not have to think about HIV and AIDS. Yeah. And so it made sense when people were starting to discover like, oh, it's sex is transmitting it. Yeah. Then the Larry Kramers and the activists were saying, well, then stop having sex. Well, I was so happy to be able to. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to hear that. People were saying, you know, would you have wrapped it up? And I know that's not a safe sex message, but no, I probably wouldn't use the condom because I was in a trusting relationship. We were getting tested, so I wouldn't change anything. 
I don't know if I would change anything either because it was wonderful to come to New York and be in love. <laughs> I love that. Um, Nigel, can you tell us about Ear Hustle and the clip that you brought today? Yes. So Ear Hustle is a podcast about everyday life inside prison. And the clip I brought is from our first episode about trying to find somebody to live with. And in our stories, we try to not just talk about life inside prison, but we try to show commonalities between outside and inside. And our other mandate is to try to mirror that inside and outside people can form professional relationships that function just like anyone else's relationship. So this is a clip from the uh, first story. They just throw anybody in the cell with me, somebody that I'm not compatible with. So I have to find someone that I'm compatible with. And then on the other hand, you don't want to tell somebody something that you want to move them in the cell and then you change your mind like, oh, man, I ain't going to be able to do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you tell the person, hey, man, what you doing, man? You know, you want to move up then? You'd be like, oh. I'm gonna go get this dude over here. It's really like dating. I mean, some of the things that you talk, I know. It's not like dating, Nigel. <laughs> there are a lot of similarities. There's, I can't even look at it that way, Nigel. <laughs> I knew you would be, so that's why I hesitated. No, but it, it is, it's a relationship. Yeah. It is a relationship. Yeah. And so that's why the idea of dating comes up, because there isn't any other time where two adults are expected to live in such close proximity. So you have to be peaceful. You don't have to talk. That's amazing. Thank you all so much for sharing. The first thing I think that comes to mind for, for so many of us when we think about this panel is really that question of objectivity. And so, Nigel, maybe let's start with Ear Hustle. You, you're obviously not in the prison system. How do you remain objective? Well, I, I volunteered inside the prison for five years before I started working on this podcast. So I spent a fair amount of time getting to know the people inside and getting the people to know me. I don't know if we're objective. I don't think that we are. I mean, I care about the people I work with. They care about me, and we want to tell amazing stories. So to be honest, I don't think objectivity is something we discuss all that much. Is that, yeah, is that no, a letdown? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I would echo that, um, and I think for a story like gentrification, which is so deeply rooted in race, um, there, was a certain, there was a certain necessity for me to be compassionate, empathetic, and also not so objective, sort of like have a conversation with folks and be like, I, can't, I, you know, I know what you're talking about and where you're coming from. Um, and I, I would say the same thing about the people that we talked to on our podcast. We tried to Tobin and I are limited in our very specific identities and viewpoints, and we're trying to cover a very large spectrum of the queer community. And we want everybody to have their own voice on the show and so that we're not telling their stories for them. So sometimes you just have to let them speak, and I don't know if that, I don't know if that makes things very objective sometimes. Could I say that maybe we try to not have judgment? And that's probably a fair way to discuss what we do as opposed to objectivity. I think that is really fair. I think another, um, another thing that we talked about a lot and that kept coming up was this idea of stereotypes and really the value of sometimes embracing stereotype in your own work and the role that it can play. I think, uh, Rebecca, in For There Goes the Neighborhood, you've mentioned that even though stereotypes can be true, it doesn't mean that the people are less valuable in that sense. And can you, can you expand a little bit more on that? Sure, yeah. The, we, in the second episode, uh, we had a character in East New York, Josh Jacobo, who, um, ha, you know, sort of by his own admission came up in the, in the drug trade. And, and, um, and that's how he sort of survived, and that's how he paid rent, and people in the community know who he is. And, you know, I mean, what was striking to me about that is just because he was sort of dealing drugs didn't make his story and his place in that community and how and, and part of that community any less valuable and, and and you know in fact it was really part of what made the community cuz he you know he didn't just sell drugs he also brought money and um and character and integrity um to his neighborhood so in that way, I think oftentimes we think, oh, okay, this person peddles in drugs or this person has um, associated with maybe a, a gang or, or any kind of thing like that or has been in prison. Um, it doesn't mean that they aren't sort of full, interesting, multidimensional people. 
I think that that note that Nigel you made about having no judgment is really like that's kind of the sweet spot of where the story can be told and I think it keeps everybody honest in that regard. Yeah. The stereotype play like what what role does stereotype play in your work? Well, I think unfortunately many people have stereotypes about who's inside prison, including journalists that sometimes come in to do stories there. And it's really disheartening. And so our, our podcast is co-hosted by an inside person and an outside person. And I really rely on Erlon to be the, the voice of inside. And we, we try to get a range of people on the show and, and let them talk about their own complexity and who they are. And, and it's constantly surprising to me to, to meet all the different men in there. And I think the stories actually surprise the guys inside. And they start to break down some of their own stereotypes about themselves and the other men that are in there. And that's fascinating to me. I think also the, that it, it, when you give voice, uh, it allows the opportunity to explore how we cultivated those stereotypes in the first place. Yeah. And that effectively will deconstruct the stereotypes. That's true. Kathy, do you have an experience that you that you can share with us? Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that at least in our show, we kind of have um, we deal with stereotypes <laughs> in kind of a, a different way. I think we we lean into them a little bit. I think we, um, at least speaking from our personal experience, like I would never do a deep dive onto a stereotype of like a trans person. I'm not that person, but. I will absolutely uh, talk about stereotypes of lesbians and, and bi people. And um, uh, one of the things that we did last season was I realized um, there's a stereotype of very masculine women that I apparently had a huge stigma against. And now I present the way I do now because I think this is actually more comfortable for me. And it didn't, it was through the process of working on that story and really digging into like what was behind my feelings on that stereotype that I didn't like. Um, that got me to where I am now. And then, and then on the flip side, we also, like, when you think lesbian, I feel like the stereotypes that come up are U-Haul lesbians, which I kind of am, like, part of that, but... U-Haul? <laughs> <laughs> lesbians, you're gonna have to I, I don't know now what that means. I need to know what that means. <laughs> Usually, this is a stereotype, not true for everybody, but... Lesbians tend to move in together really quickly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so I, I, I've done that and <laughs> not. Um, but also, straight people do that too, and they don't get a U-Haul stereotype moniker. Um, uh, you think that. And then you think, like, they've probably seen the L word. And I had never done that, so I was like, maybe that's a stereotype that I need to, like, dive into and just see what it's about. Um, it was like the stereotype was guiding my culture. So um, we, tried, we, we tried to like do different things like that on the show just to em really embrace it and see whether there's truth in it, and, and, but only from our personal perspective. That's great. One thing that I was really struck by listening to all of your shows and, um, and at least like two of the... Uh, two of the clips that we heard today was just the role that humor plays mm -hmm. in your work. And it's, it's really heartening, especially in the drama-prone society that we are in, but you, and the really heavy subjects that you guys can tackle. And, you know, the humor has the effect of distancing. It has the effect of humanizing, really. Nigel, can you talk about that ear hustle clip again and how humor is really helpful in the work that you do? Yeah, the show is really funny. <laughs> it, uh, well, I think it surprised people. And in fact, I remember we got a little bit of criticism at the beginning for using humor. And my response to that was, if you've been in prison, you realize there's a lot of humor in there. I mean, people need it to get by. There's just very funny men in there. And so... It's what comes up naturally. Sometimes I'm surprised by it. We did an episode recently talking about the three strikes law, and men were talking about their horrendous sentences, you know, 1,000 years, 800 years, and they're laughing talking about it because I, maybe there's no other response to the absurdity of it. Yeah. But we also want to reiterate, I always say this, that everything that happens inside prison happens outside prison. And so why would you expect that men inside or women inside are always serious and angry? That's absurd. It's really you know, turning them into a, a cartoon. Yeah. I, <laughs> I had a, another clip um, that we don't have time to play, but uh, when I was reporting in Williamsburg, um, I sort of 
ran into this, this black man, and you don't really see a lot of black folks in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, so I was talking to him, and he was like, yeah, I moved here, you know, because it's, cause it's diverse. Like, I, I see diversity here. And I was like, uh, okay, you see diversity <laughs> here. Um, where do you get your haircut? Oh, yeah, I got to go back to the hood to get my haircut. You know, like, the, like <laughs> completely, what my, you know, proved my point. Um, but just that it was just the most perfect Pitch perfect, funny moment, um, a, a, a light, you know, to lighten the, the, yeah. the Rebecca, you, heaviness. Yeah. You also did that great adoption piece on Sporkful, that yeah. was, you know, and well, talking about the trauma and abortion and, and sorry, and abortion. Wow, in adoption, Amina, where my mind is, <laughs> like a bit, I've been signing all these petitions all week, and my brain is there. And uh, but you really talk about how that trauma doesn't. It's not the only thing that has to be in the hard stories that we tell. Yes, I, that, I did not, that was not me okay. on Sporkful. I did do a lot of the consulting on that piece. Okay. Um, so in terms of the trauma not being the, mm -hmm. the, yeah, I mean, if we're talking about adoption, are we talking about adoption? No, we just, um, I think Rachel wanted us to talk about that today. But no, but uh, ask again, because I'm trying to. <laughs> no, it's fine. I think, I think you've really, you've answered like the bulk of it because your, your clip had that like really, like the humor, the humor in it is also like very sad. It's like the fact that people, all these people are getting displaced and they can, you know, oh, yeah. of finding, you like kind of find your people. And there, I think that that's something that as people of color, we do all the time, no matter what. Yeah, I mean, that also, that, yeah. that, can I get a latte? That was part yeah. of it. Like that w was where I met this woman in, in, a, in a cafe and, the, and this white woman, of course, with like a double wide stroller, comes in, like pushes <laughs> past the table that we're sitting at, bumps through, can I get a latte? And this woman and I are just sitting there like, this it writes itself, writes itself, yeah. <laughs> And Kathy, you've also mentioned that you wanted to see more humor in some trans identity pieces. Can you yeah. talk about that more? Well, I think just generally for the show, I feel like Tobin put this in a really uh, good way. He wants the show to be a, a defender of queer joy because frequently our... our <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Yay, Tobin. You're not even here and we're talking about you. <laughs> He's probably watching right now. Hi. <laughs> He's probably watching. Like, yeah. <laughs> Um, because frequently our stories show up in the news and it's usually some tragedy and that I feel like doesn't allow us to present our full lives to the world and uh, of course there's tragedy but there's also joy and there's also humor and we love to really um, lean into the humor part in our in our stories even though even though I do get a lot of feedback that we're making everybody cry all the time and we're sorry <laughs> but we're trying to be funny usually. It's just that most people are not used to hearing either somebody like them or somebody close to them being represented um, in the podcast world, I guess. Um, but I am a huge, uh, I, I love having humor in our, in our um, episodes. Like my favorite episodes have to do with Golden Girls, um, <laughs> when we had yes. a story about Rufus Wainwright meeting his, his idol, B. Arthur, and how mean she was to him. <laughs> that show, man. I mean, people love that show. Yeah. And the gays love that show. Love that show. I, I mean, I mean, is it because Everything of I've Bee? learned is from it's, Golden Girls. I, I think a lot of it has to do with B. Just yeah. Um, yeah. her no-nonsense attitude to the world. And, um, and also, I want to say her flowy, long, flowy outfits yes. and gowns. Caftans. Was that what they were? Caftans? I have no idea. Okay. Definitely I, caftans. Yeah. yeah. Caftans. For yeah, sure. love that lo love that story because it's just hilarious, um, <laughs> and it speaks so much to our gay culture. Um, and the other one I really loved was um, a story that our producer Matt made about uh, queer baiting in Harry Potter world, and uh, we got so much flack from Harry Potter fans. They were upset. Hardcore. We, hardcore. Oh my god, what were they, they were more about? upset about that <laughs> than they were about gay Republicans. Like they were very <laughs> upset about Harry Potter. Um, it's the Potter hive. Yeah, we yeah. touched a nerve with that yeah. one. Yeah. We're going to try to do it again, but I don't know how. <laughs> yeah, but humor is important, I think, to, to show, like, we all have full lives. Yeah, it's like, surprise, we're all three-dimensional full people. I <laughs> know. Um, <We're> people. <laughs> I want to dive a little bit more into audience and how it informs your work. Nigel, there's a, there's a fairly educational component mm -hmm. to Ear Hustle. Um, was that part of the reason that you wanted to create the show? 
Well, we definitely wanted to expand people's thoughts about who's incarcerated, but we didn't want to make an educational show. Mm -hmm. So I think that maybe it's just a byproduct yeah. of, of what we do. We really wanted to just tell everyday stories and not the kinds of stories that you would see in the news or that you read, read, read in the newspaper, um, things that you'd only get to know by having intimate conversations with people. And we try, and we talk about serious topics. We've done, as I said, stories about three strikes, about solitary confinement, but we're never about the statistics um, or about beating people over the head. That would put me to sleep. Um, I think people are persuaded by first person narratives from um, uh, people who have an amazing and sometimes deeply difficult story to tell. We do get a lot of emails from people about how it's educated them and made them think about the prison system in a different way, and that's fantastic. That's what we hoped would happen, but we didn't want to be like a textbook or a news hour program. Oh, Nigel, yeah. you guys ask a lot for postcards. Yes. Is that the yes. way that you can bring it in for Erlan and everybody to see? Yeah, so we ask people to send us what we call kites, which is a form of prison communication, and we've gotten just thousands and thousands of beautiful postcards with comments and questions on them, and I have them all, like, crazily organized in this archival way. And so I have to get them all approved before they go in, but then I can bring them in and Erlan can look through all of oh. them. And it's really amazing to see how excited all of the people inside get. And the other byproduct that's been quite interesting is um, listeners writing in to find out how they can write to the different men inside. And I think that's great too, because that's another way of creating a conversation oh. between people who don't have experience yeah. in prison. And one woman wrote and she said her goal is to try to send a birthday card to every single man inside San Quentin. Oh my God. And I was like, that's so <laughs> ambitious, but what a beautiful yeah. like endeavor yeah. to try to figure out how to do that. So that's the kind of education I totally dig, yeah. right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I think that one of the very main tool, um, goals for There Goes a Neighborhood was to give folks the tools to talk about gentrification. And, and, I, and I mean that in very much uh, a way of, you know, black people being, black and brown people being pushed out and white people coming in. Um, so in tandem with the podcast when we launched, I um, produced and curated a, a, a series of live events oh. where people would come and just kind of talk about discomfort and, um, you know, identifying whether, you know, moving into a neighborhood is inherently racist or, you know, all these kinds of things that are necessary in order to create a community. It's like, how do you show up in these communities? Um, so it was really deeply important to us to connect with the audience, certainly with the podcast, but outside of the podcast as well. And don't you think every listener was so grateful for that experience? I do, I do, and that's super gratifying. Yeah. And uh, Kathy, how does your, the, the audience that you write for, like how does that inform how you make the show? Um, I, I tend to read every single um, email, tweet, Facebook message, anything that comes in I'll read. Um, and I get a pretty good sense of the kind of topics that people uh, want us to present. And it's just a matter of us like waiting for the right story to come along to really make the narrative stories that we want, um, that we like and we want to share with the world. Um, it's, it's focused uh, our search for like the topics that we want to cover. Like mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of requests for stories on religion, stories about um, um, different parts of the uh, LGBTQIA 2S plus spectrum, um, like asexuality, we're gonna try to do something about that, but we never wanna make the, the identity sort of the focal point of a story. Like uh, the point of our show is to feature queer people living their lives, so uh, it's, it's just waiting for the right story to come along, but. Yeah. Also, I would say like the other part is sometimes the audience, uh, the listeners that write in, they just want to talk to somebody that um, they feel listens to them or feels like they, they felt some connection with the story we presented and they just want to tell somebody that I feel heard or I feel seen and thank you for doing that. And those are like the, the most um, amazing messages that I think I get. Um, from listeners, and, and um, I try to write back to every single person. I'm a little bit behind, but 
Sometimes I, I've, I've got like a lot of um, email pen pals right now. I'm like two months behind, but I'll, I'll get to you. <laughs> I'll get to you. What a, what a worthy endeavor to respond to. Oh, yeah, yeah. it really is. <laughs> it's like I'm, al I'm already thinking about my own inbox and want to just run away Oh, right I know. Now. Yeah, yeah. Inbox zero, you guys. It's the way to go. <laughs> no, I don't even know how that's possible. I'm, I'm an inbox thousand it person, is. so it's, uh, it's Get to fine. zero, you guys. I'm at one right now. I'm so close. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that um, all, all of us actually touched on when we, when we were having our pre-call our pre for this was this idea of like never having tokens and really thinking about the production staff matching the material, like when that is possible, if it's possible, like all of the different dimensions that that can, that can take. So, I, I, and this is a question for all of you. What do you really look for in terms of an editor and what can really help you succeed to be seen, heard, and create a good story? And I think that for all three of you, that is different, obviously. Yeah. yeah. What do we look for in an editor? Mm -hmm. Or in production staff and how that really um, informs the actual making of the podcast and how the right. stories come out. Well, I think as, with, as in any medium, um, certainly with storytelling, the most important thing is to lead with curiosity um, and to really just want to know and to ask and to delve deep and to find stories and characters that are original and um, thoughtful and provocative and funny. Um, and I really think to do that, you have to be curious all the time. Um, and so that's what I look for in folks that I want to work with. Um, and then just a sort of, you know, I'm not a super, um, I'm not a perfectionist so much, so I look for people who are. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, that's what, that's what I look for. Um, I don't, unfortunately, have much of a say in what my, who my staff is, but we're really lucky that our team includes me and Tobin, our producer, Matt, who's a queer person, and our sound designer is a queer person, and our social media person is a queer person. Um, it's a pretty well-rounded uh, staff of queer people, which I love. Um, but higher up, our editor and our executive producers are not in the queer community. And sometimes we come across uh, limitations where somebody will make a comment, I'm not gonna say who, and we're like, what <laughs> is that about? <laughs> Sorry, finish your no, point, no, no, but then ahead, I want to just ahead. add on to it because I wasn't thinking, I was thinking, of course, like just generally speaking, what I look for, obviously, in a perfect world, uh, I, would, I, want, I want to have black and brown people on every project that I work on, yeah. across, across the board, across genre, across everything. Um, and, and recently, because I'm working on a, on a pilot for a new podcast that is actually about black folks, um, I sort of cast a very wide net to, to find folks to work with me. Um, and there were a lot of sort of young black folks coming into the podcast world, which is great. And I love seeing all the black and brown faces here um, today. But at the senior level, it's pretty much nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we, we have to figure out ways to, um, to, to bring folks up to that level, whatever, whatever that means and however mm -hmm. we do that, and maybe it's a, a work it, uh, you know, thing next year, like how, how to make sure that, that, um, that black and brown folks get yeah, up to the totally. to positions of, of senior positions, because we're in these spaces where someone in a senior position will be like, well, I don't really get that. And you're like, well, you know, I don't really need you to get that. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what it's about. It's, it's a different experience. Um, so that I just think is super critical. Yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, only me and Tobin are the people of color on our on our team. So it would be nice if somebody on our staff <laughs> and only also, make it more interesting. It would, yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and make room for telling more, make room for telling yeah. more stories, and for expanding really the imagination of yeah. what all of the the white people who produce podcasts <laughs> could be capable of. I be think because yeah. no matter how open, liberal, thoughtful white folks believe they are, <laughs> they are still <laughs> making decisions through a white lens. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really important to, for, to, for that to be talked about, you know? So even if you're saying, okay, if you're even deferring to my experience, it's like, okay, I appreciate you deferring to my experience. Now I want you to actually internalize what I'm saying to you right. and make that part of your brain. 
right? It's not just, okay, that's what Rebecca, black woman, says. I need to listen to that, but actually put it inside your brain for the next mm -hmm. conversation that we have. Yeah, and I think that... I think that we took from um, another round, which has been hugely influential Ooh, on mm -hmm. our show, is that <clears throat> Tobin and I have agreed that we will explain terms or whatever if it doesn't make sense to other people in the queer community. But if it's something that most queer people know mm -hmm. and it's just the straight world that doesn't know, we're not going to explain it. We don't need to expl explain it. Right. No emotional right. labor for That's anybody. Right. That's <laughs> absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Nigel, like, I think your experience in this is obviously a little different, right? Yes. As somebody who is not part of the prison system, helping tell stories of people who are mm -hmm. inside and also the larger racial dynamics that are at play there. Well, when we started everything, you know, I was the only outside person that was part of the production. So Erlon and I were um, the co-creators, co-hosts and co-producers. And then the sound design is done by another incarcerated person. And I couldn't quite hear what you were saying, so I'm... Assuming oh, I, was what you asking, I was asking if you could share like your experience of um, like how you really handle that situation. Well, I, I handle it by 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 knowing that um, I don't have the answers, that I'm oh. going to get things wrong, that I'm curious and I'm okay with making mistakes and having people correct me. And that because when we started, none of us knew, or Erlon, Antoine, and I didn't know anything about this world. We started at the same level. We had to learn together. We had to learn the technical stuff. We, we had to do everything. And we really had to support each other and rise together or fail together. And mm -hmm. so I think that was super helpful. But I always remind myself, I don't have to, I always know this, that I always can walk out the gate and the guys I work with can't. And so um, I... I want to be equal with them, but I understand that I'll never completely get their experience. Um, and so they kind of drive the ship in a way. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm invisible in it either. I mean, I'm you know, a creator in it. But um, recently we started having some more outside people help us. We now have an editor who's not incarcerated and people from Radiotopia. And it's been a very great experience. Actually, we haven't had a problem with it because I think they feel the same way that they aren't the experts here. Um, that we've got some really powerful storytellers that are going to make it work. Yeah. That's great. Um, maybe this is more for Rebecca and Kathy. Do you feel really protective of the stories that you tell when you work with people who do not share your identity? Wildly. Ugh. Wildly protective, yeah. Um, all of, you know, the voices, the characters um, who I care deeply about anyway, and I think that that's also a part of making great podcasts is finding people that you want to spend time with. Um, and so the, the folks in, in There Goes the Neighborhood um, all have incredible spirits um, and, and great sense of humor, but also are um, in a different class system, in a different... Uh, community and a different than, than a lot of um, the producers or folks that I work with at WMIC. So yes, to answer that question, I feel super protective um, of those characters and those voices. Um, and since I frequently do stories about myself, when, some, when I'm editing a story about myself and somebody, my poor editors are like, I don't know about this part of the story. I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> this is very hard for me. <laughs> So I get very protective. <laughs> and people, I've, I've thrown tantrums in my head. I'm like, they don't get it. This is so hard. Why in your head? Throw oh, down. Because I, you know, business. Business, right. It's Professional. Business world. World. <laughs> I don't know, though. I mean, I think, I, obviously, you can't, like, throw full-on tantrums every time. But, yeah. but I do think that those really impassioned moments are important to share, yeah. and, and especially all the more so if it makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, I just, I just really have had it with kind of like, you know, not saying what needs to be said, especially now, <laughs> what we're dealing with. Yeah. You know, the way, there's too much at stake. There's yeah. too much at stake. So it really, I think, is r critically important <clears throat> for those of us black and brown people and uh, people of color who are in this podcast world, in public radio, in public media, which is largely white, um, to be incredibly vocal, to be incredibly honest, to be incredibly fearless, and to, to believe that your voice is going to actually change the course of the future of this industry. 
I'm going to clap to that one more time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, like, one of the things that's been just really great about being here, obviously, is the fact that it is a, um, like, there are no white men here. I, like, I feel like I can say that. (laughs) In just, in this way where I, I feel like we, a lot of people here have been a little more honest. There's been space to, to share of yourself and a lot of us have so many of the same frustrations around credentialism in mm. this arena that we work with. And I think that you all do incredible deep storytelling, incredible reporting and opening up, like, you know, you're literally pioneering spaces that a lot of times radio refuses to go in. And I was just wondering if you can, like, if we can talk about that a little bit, about how, like, we are forever questioned Mm. for the choices that we make or whether we can actually, like, are we good editors? Are we good producers? Are we good storytellers? And and a lot of times it seems that our colleagues who are, don't look like us, do not get that same kind of pressure. I think that's absolutely true. And I think that the the hardest thing to do is to not internalize that, um, but to flip it on its head, which is to mm-hmm. say, if, if I feel questioned about my credentials, like I sort of come back with, well, here are the credentials, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it, it, rather than, and I think it's really hard for young folks coming up to black and brown and, and of color who, who internalize that questioning mm-hmm. and, and it really hinders and, st- and stunts their imagination, it stunts their careers and where they could possibly go, but that it's just, you have to t- kind of, tell yourself, flip it over, and deliver your credentials. You're, you're, you just have them, and believe that you have them. I feel like you're talking to me right now, and I'm learning a lot. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I'm, really I'm so glad, because you do. That. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. I've seen you Will at you work. Will you be my mentor? <laughs> <laughs> sure, okay, I'd be great. happy to. Great, I got something out of this. <laughs> um, my question actually came from, uh, from journalists, questioning why I'm a visual artist that's uh, I don't have any background in journalism or audio work and so that was the where my questioning came from like mm-hmm. who do you think you are to do this but what was interesting to me was nobody questioned Erlon on that he's not a journalist either yeah. but the question only came mm-hmm. to me I thought that was very curious yeah I don't remember which one of you it was that said on our call but it really struck with me about how white guys might have invented podcasts, but they did not invent voice. You know? I might have, yeah. Just, yeah, I uh, might have said I that. I'm like, that's probably yeah. who might have said that. And I was like, write that down. That yeah. was just, I was like, that's my pep talk for the day. I'm going to go forth very confidently. Um, well, thank you all so much. We're going to take two questions, if you have them, one on each side, and, uh, and we'll wrap up for the day. I see people running, yeah. so that's a, good, that's a good sign. There you go. Great, go for it. Oh yeah, okay, thanks. Um, My name is Lucy, and I love this panel and thought it was amazing. Um, I'm a huge fan of Ear Hustle. I've been volunteering in the prison system in California for three years, Um, starting a podcast. Thanks. Thank you. (laughs) Um, I'm starting a podcast called Life on the Outside, and it's kind of um, what happens once a lot of the life or community, a lot of the the guys you work with get out. and I know them, and I've, I've yeah, I, I work with them. They're like my volunteer coworkers. Um, and yet I'm, I'm still coming from a position. There's still positionality. Um, and so I, I do my best to, um, I'm curious, I'm still learning, and our, our uh, recordings are, converse, you know, they're just conversations. I guess my question, something you guys have touched on, and it's for all of you, is um, they're not on my production side. And I think one of the credits mm. to Ear Hustle is that you're not just, the content isn't just the both of you sharing equally, but they get to, they get to edit. They get to do all the, they get to choose. And that, when it comes down to it, like I walk home with the tape and right, I choose right. what to do with it and how to cut it and, and what words of theirs I'm using. And I'm not in a position right now, it's just me, to staff them or train them or work with a larger team that's inclusive of them. So I'm guessing, I'm asking, um, what can I do that's responsible and transparent? And should I be doing anything if that's the case? Um, yeah, is there any responsibility there? Are, I mean, are you, it sounds like you're talking about agency a little bit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what I, as I mentioned earlier with There Goes a Neighborhood, in tandem with it, I uh, curated a couple of live events. And at those events were characters from the, from the podcast mm-hmm. who then actually sort of led these conversations um, with, either with each other or with the audience. Um, and I felt like that was a really uh, a, a good way to kind of 
give them agency as part of the process of telling their stories. I, mean, I have a lot to say this, and I'm not going to take up the time, but I'd be happy to talk with you after about it, because it is really complicated. And um, I wouldn't have gotten involved in Ear Hustle if Erlan and I couldn't have been co-creators. It's just so effing messy. And you've got to be, you've, you've got to do a lot of deep soul searching, because there's a lot of damage that can be done if you don't. So like I said, I could talk about this for a long time, so I'm happy to chat yeah, with you. To you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great, we're gonna take one more question and uh, all of our information should be on the screen so you can find everybody else from the panel. So sorry we don't have time for everyone. Here you go. Hi, I'm Rachel um, and I am I have bipolar disorder. I'm doing a podcast about, about mental illness and um, I'm wondering, you all talked about <clears throat> the importance of humor and I'm wondering um, if you have any suggestions of how to bring that in more, how to foster that in your interviews. <laughs> I think it just yeah, has to it's really I mean, it hard. Just has to be who you are, it's right? hard to produce yeah. humor. I mean, yeah. it, it really is either there or it's not there. But I will say that the the more the more open the rapport you have with mm -hmm. whoever it is that you're talking to, the more it lends itself to humor. Yeah, and, and follow the things that that make you like laugh. And whatever you're going to find funny, you're going to be able to foster in other people too, and lean into those things because they're probably different than what we think is going to be funny, and then that'll be unique. That's not a very satisfying answer, I know, I know but, <laughs> well, <thank laughs> but it is, the, is what happens. Yeah. Thank you so much to everybody, and thank you to our panelists yeah. for being here. Good job, everybody. Good job. Good job. Hey, everybody, before you go, I just want to remind you to come back to this space at 1 o'clock sharp. We're going to have Kelly McEvers here doing a live brand, brand, brand new episode of Embedded. So come back and check that out. Have fun at lunch. <laughs>